I do cardiovascular medicine, but I have to be a good gastroenterologist. Otherwise, I can't clean up the mess that's coming in. There's a huge amount of data now on gut health, the microbiome, and how gastrointestinal problems are directly linked to cardiovascular problems. The driving force for all cardiovascular events, whether it's heart attack or stroke and, and other kidney diseases, is related to your nighttime blood pressure. So the nocturnal blood pressure, if it's elevated, that's the highest predictive risk for having an event. What I would like your audience to understand is the way uh, atherosclerosis, coronary heart disease, and vascular disease progress is it starts out usually in your teen years with functional changes, and then those progress later on to functional structural changes, and then later they go into really bad structural changes. Welcome back. It's Mike Munzel with High Intensity Health Radio. This is episode number 63 with Dr. Mark Houston. So if you've been searching for cutting edge assessment, treatment, and prevention tips to reduce your risk of heart disease, you found the right podcast because Dr. Mark Houston is one of the world's leading experts when it comes to preventative cardiovascular medicine. So he teaches doctors all throughout the globe as to different strategies to reduce their patient's risk of heart disease. And he sees patients all throughout the globe as well at the Hypertension Institute in Nashville, Tennessee. So I've known Dr. Houston since 2000 and his information keeps getting better and better and better. He just does not stop. And just a well-spoken guy, very informative and super smart. I think you're really gonna enjoy this episode. So everything from 24-hour blood pressure monitoring, you're gonna learn about uh, everything from assessing the functionality of our HDL and LDL lipoproteins. You know, the standard cholesterol testing, as you know, is just kind of so obsolete, it's not even funny. And he's gonna share with you some ways that you can optimize the functionality of your HDL and your LDL. And so different uh, anti-inflammatory botanicals, nutritional products, essential fatty acids. He's going to share with you 24-hour blood pressure monitoring and why that's so important and why just a one-time blood pressure is not really telling the whole story. So tons of great information and most importantly, he's going to talk about the gut in extensive detail. And uh, as he, you know, as you learned in the introduction, he does cardiovascular medicine, but uh, he has to be a great gastroenterologist to really understand kind of the patient's risk and ways to modulate that because the uh, bacterial uh, infiltrate coming from the GI tract poses a huge inflammatory response and uh, metabolic abnormalities that are linked with poor cardiovascular outcomes. So if you want to learn a little bit more about this, we didn't dive into metabolic endotoxemia and ways to reduce metabolic endotoxemia that much in this episode, but if you want to go to belly fat e Effect.com. I have two videos all about circadian rhythms and this metabolic endotoxemia where you can learn more about that, learn uh, different foods and nutritional supplements and lifestyle strategies to reduce that inflammatory load. So again, that's bellyfateffect.com for those two videos. And I posted the show notes here with Dr. Mark Houston at highintensityhealth.com slash DR Houston. So hope you enjoy this episode and any comments you can leave, you know, feedback for you know things you learned or uh, different tips that you'd like to learn more about, I would love to hear from you on the YouTube uh, channel. So hope you enjoy this episode and we'll catch you on the next episode. I'm so glad you're with us today. We're with a good friend of mine, Dr. Mark Houston. And we're going to talk all about cardiovascular disease and some of his advanced strategies and science. And he's been lecturing to clinicians about advanced assessment and diagnosis of heart disease for quite some time. He's a director of the Hypertension Institute in Vascular Biology in Nashville, Tennessee. And he's also the author of many books, including the Hypertension Handbook for Clinicians, which I was reading just before we got on the call to get some talking points. So that's a great one if you guys are practitioners. And also a great book too for uh, everyone in general, What Your Doctor May Not Tell You About Heart Disease, which is available on Amazon. So Dr. Houston, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Michael. It's good to be here as well. Love it. So let's dive into, I guess, to lay the context and talk about some of your you know, background. Let's talk about your clinic because you're you know, board certified internal medicine practitioner, but obviously your clinic is really unique and focused on cardiovascular disease. You want to share with us a little bit about what you do? Absolutely. Well, I started out in general internal medicine and then became board certified in hypertension by the American Society of Hypertension and then went on to get anti-aging boards as well. Then I went back and got two master's degrees in uh, human nutrition and metabolic medicine. So my practice really is integrative cardiovascular medicine where we combine the best of both worlds with lifestyle changes, uh, nutrition, exercise, supplements, and certainly you should probably eat you know, really good food. So what we're trying to do is prevent cardiovascular disease, not just uh, wait until someone has it and then try to fill in the gaps and plug the holes. 
Love that. And so you have some advanced strategies that you can really assess the health of the cardiovascular system. I think let's kind of talk about lipids first and then transition to the endothelium. Let's talk about why lipids, you know, lipid assessment doesn't really tell us the whole story. Certainly. Well, as you, as you know, there are quite a few risk factors for coronary heart disease. And unfortunately, in the United States, we've become sort of a lipid-centric society and think that if we get those under control, that no one's going to have any heart attacks. The problem with that is it, it leaves out a lot of the other very important risk factors. But even more important probably is the methodologies that have been used to measure serum lipids have not done advanced testing. They've done the old obsolete testing measuring just total levels of cholesterol, LDL, triglycerides, and HDL. Uh, what we've been doing now for literally over 15 years is advanced lipid testing, which tells you not only the levels of these different lipids, but also the particle size, particle number, and even in some cases, the functionality of HDL in reverse cholesterol transport, that is the ability to take cholesterol out of the cells and get it out of the body. Mm-hmm. And in my opinion, most of the advanced lipid tests that are available, but you know, five companies that do this now really well, if you don't do advanced lipid testing, you cannot even determine the risk of the patient, nor can you determine treatment and adequacy of therapy. Mm-hmm. I remember from our time in Colorado when you did a seminar for us back in 09, I think you, you had a great analogy about, I think it was a tennis net and tennis balls and golf balls. So for people that are trying to visualize like, wait, what is Dr. Houston talking about? How come, you know, what is what is he saying with blood cholesterol? Does it mean anything? Do you want to talk about the size of the particles and use that analogy and, and really illustrate that for people? Certainly. What drives coronary heart disease and heart attack risk is is the number of LDL particles and the size of LDL particles. So LDL, which is low-density lipoprotein, if you have a lot of them and they're very small, they tend to get in through the lining of the vascular system and into a, a subendothelial layer where they cause inflammation, oxidative stress, immune dysfunction, and eventually uh, plaque formation, and then that ruptures and causes a heart attack. So if you think of the, uh, the tennis uh, net analogy, this is how it would work. The tennis net would be the lining of the vascular system. That's called the endothelium. And you have blood on one side, uh, and then you have the subendothelial layer on the other side, which is where you end up with all this inflammatory mess that can cause plaque formation. Let's say you're a tennis player, and you're trying to hit a tennis ball through the net. The tennis ball will not go through the net, but a golf ball, which is smaller, will go through the net. So the big tennis ball is the big big LDL, and the small tennis ball is the, uh, I mean, small golf ball is small LDL. Um, so if you have a lot of small golf balls, they're going to go through the net to the other side and then start the inflammatory atherosclerotic process. Um, so the large particles typically are not as atherogenic as the small particles unless a person's really got some issues with inflammation and, and infection. But typically it's the small particles, lots of them, that cause a problem with the LDL. Mm-hmm. Now, on the other, the other side of this, Mike, is the HDL, and the HDL is the cleanup crew. So if you get a lot of the golf balls on the other side of the net and you have a large wheelbarrow to go out and pick all of them up, then you might be able to do that in maybe one trip. But if you have a very small pail, you might only get a few of them and have to make multiple trips. And if the if any of those have problems, like the handle's broken or the tire's flat on the wheelbarrow, you're not going to be able to move it in and out as fast. It takes more time, doesn't work as well. And that is what's called dysfunctional. So the, the point I'm making here is HDL has to be big. Uh, you want a lot of the HDL, and you want it to function well. So the wheelbarrow... Uh, lots of wheelbarrows moving in and out one time that a good has a good wheel is functional HDL is big. So I want to talk about LDL, but let, let's finish up on HDL here. So what are some lifestyle factors that, and that's a great analogy, by the way, Dr. Houston, I love that wheelbarrow analogy. So what sort of lifestyle factors or uh, you know nutritional abnormalities lead to this so-called dysfunctional HDL and affect the wheelbarrow? The most common reason people have dysfunctional HDL is they're inflamed or infected or have heavy metals. So bad micronutrient intake, bad macronutrient intake, someone who's inflamed for any reason, it doesn't matter what it is, it can be rheumatoid arthritis, it can be chronic infections or whatever, and in heavy metals, any of them, mercury, lead, arsenic, 
um, and even heavy metals like iron. So all those things make your HDL not work well. And once that happens, there's no oxidative defense, there's no good reverse cholesterol transport, or any of the other things that HDL does so well to actually prevent atherosclerosis. And this is why it's so important to do this advanced testing that you introduce the call with, because if you're just looking at your standard cholesterol panel and your HDL may be high, we don't know if that's good functional HDL or bad functional HDL. Is that right? No, and, and also what we measure is the modification of, of LDL, which is oxidized or acetylated or glycated LDL, because that's the one that's really atherogenic. Even when it's small and modified, it's really bad. And we measure the ability of HDL to function well by using indirect parameters like myeloperoxidase and C-reactive protein, which tell you if your HDL has dysfunctionality. Mm, love where this call is going. Now, let's get a little granular here. And, and we talked about, you know, the, the tennis net and then if the golf balls go through, you have this Pac-Man analogy, like why is it so bad when these small little LDL particles get inside our endothelial space? Like what happens there? Okay, the, the small LDL particles uh, tend to be more atherogenic for a lot of reasons. Uh, one is they're more likely to be modified. So uh, they can get oxidized, they can become inflamed, acetylated, or glycated by, by glucose. That is very common in patients who are diabetic, have insulin resistance, uh, obesity, or metabolic syndrome. And uh, so when they're small like that, they, they also stay in that subendothelial layer. They, they stick and you can't get them out. They're, they're stuck in these what we call little forks of the tree, basically. And so then these macrophages, which is a type of white cell, it will invade into that layer below the endothelium, and they love to eat uh, uh, these small LDL particles. And uh, the macrophages have these uh, receptors on their lining. It's called, it's called scavenger receptors. And the macrophages have no appetite control. So uh, they can engulf and eat this small LDL all day long until they literally burst and pop. And then all that mess, literally, which is oxidized and and modified LDL, inflammatory markers and cytokines and other things, literally rupture into the subendothelial layer and even out into the lumen. And they cause the area to to clot and you have an acute myocardial infarction or heart attack. So this is when you hear people say like the narrowing or the placking of arteries, that's the process that you just described. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. The plaque is the obstructed disease actually in the lumen of the artery. Wow. So we'll talk about nutrition later, but any real, you know, hot nutritional items, whether it's lifestyle, diet, exercise, supplements that you can talk about right now that may interfere with this process? Yeah, there's uh, actually there's a, new, a paper I just wrote, a scientific paper. It's in mm-hmm. Journal of Clinical Hypertension, and also I just published one in Journal of Clinical Lipidology. And it goes into what's known now as 38 different mechanisms that you can interrupt with nutrition or nutraceutical supplements that block this entire process of uh, what I call dyslipidemic-induced vascular disease. But to give you an example of some of the things that, that do that, uh, lycopene, which is in uh, you know tomatoes and, and grapefruit, uh, things like lipoic acid, N-acetylcysteine, uh, resveratrol, um, berberine, red yeast rice, niacin, uh, phytosterols. I mean, the, the list is enormous. There's probably, I would guess, close to 50 different supplements that we use now to interrupt this process. And then, of course, the Mediterranean diet with lots of uh, extra virgin olive oil, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, which you can get either supplement or through uh, cold water fish. All of these are important, as well as a low-carbohydrate, refined-carbohydrate diet, mm-hmm. you know, and getting into some, some different food groups. But that's kind of a, a brief overview of nutrition and supplements, and we can certainly expand on that later if you want to. Sure, yeah. And then for the listeners, if they want to actually get access to that paper, I'll post the show notes at highintensityhealth.com slash drhouston and links to Dr. Mark Houston's website and those research articles because there's quite a few out out there and that one sounds new and I haven't checked it out so thanks for sharing that before we transition to more of blood pressure and so forth let's kind of talk about some of the testing you recommended that or said that there's five companies right now that do really good testing I know you've recommended spectra cell for some time what are some of the top labs and, and tests that people should be aware of for lipids yeah so uh, spectra cell uh, which is in Houston Texas liposcient which is in North Carolina Boston Heart Lab, which is in uh, obviously in Boston, and then there's uh, Atherotech, which is in Birmingham, Alabama. Those would be my probably top four companies I'd recommend for you right now. 
Gotcha. Since I'm a Seahawk fan, we'll, we'll go with Boston. Huh? We'll go with those fetch yourself. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it sounds really good. So we'll put that on the, on the show notes there. And um, let's transition to endothelial dysfunction and, and talk about blood pressure and some of the, the problems there. So we've kind of talked about how lipids become modified and, and they affect the, the vascular layer. Is that really how we get what you call ED? Well, endothelial dysfunction, abbreviated ED, is it can be caused by numerous insults. You know, there's actually in, in the book that you mentioned earlier, what your doctor may not tell you about heart disease, I list 400 risk factors for heart disease that can affect endothelial function. Uh, you know, the top five that are typically talked about you know, are, are, are blood pressure, lipids, diabetes, obesity, and smoking. But that's only five out of 300, 395 others that, that people don't talk about. But all of these uh, are insults on endothelial lining that cause endothelial dysfunction. And the endothelial dysfunction uh, is related to inflammation, oxidative stress, immune dysfunction within the arteries, and as well as clotting and abnormal growth factors uh, that make the arteries very stiff, lose their elasticity, make the heart big, and even cause heart failure as well as heart attacks. We've had Ralph Holsworth on the show before, and he's really into uh, blood viscosity and so forth and donating blood and, and some of those, you know, like the hemodynamics. Are, are you a fan of, of blood donation and reducing blood thickness? Well, what you're really measuring with a, a blood viscosity is all the components that increase your risk for sludging and clotting. So we, we you can measure viscosity directly, or you can measure parameters that, that make your blood viscous, for like, for example, fibrinogen, C-reactive protein, and other things that make an increased red cell mass. So most of those you can get in some routine panel. And if you have those, then you know your blood's going to be viscous. Mm-hmm. And then you can just see those track down and usually the viscosity goes away. So I think either, either one of those is fine to do. Mm-hmm. And do you recommend periodic blood donation? Well, you know, that really depends on a lot of things. It depends on your serum iron level. It depends on your red cell count. So if you have an increased uh, red cell count, um, uh, and, you know, for that, that usually for a man, you start getting some sludging, usually 50 to 52. Uh, women may be a little bit lower. So if you get into those ranges, uh, you know, doing phlebotomy at the Red Cross is a great thing to do. Mm-hmm. And if you have an elevated serum iron, which is, you know, genetic hemochromatosis, then you have to have the iron uh, removed because iron is toxic as well. Awesome. And you've been a great pioneer in illustrating for clinicians that they should use the elasticity test, the arterial elasticity. And I was with one of your students, Scott Rander Whelan, and actually got that done on myself. And, and it sounds like that's a direct measurement of endothelial dysfunction. Uh, you're measuring actually two things. We have two tests in the hypertension institute that, that look at your artery health, which can predict your risk in the future for a heart attack. One is called the endopat, which measures the actual lining of the blood vessel. That's your endothelial lining, and that's that's called endothelial dysfunction when that's abnormal. This test is very accurate, very specific. It can be done in about 20 to 30 minutes. correlates with stroke, heart attack, renal failure in the future. And uh, we also now have a software package uh, that is added to the endopat for endothelial function that measures two other things that are very important for cardiovascular disease. One of them is called heart rate variability, which is uh, the beat-to-beat change in your heart rhythm, which can predict risk for sudden death and arrhythmias. Uh, and the other one is called augmentation index, which measures the arterial stiffness and elasticity in the large and medium-sized arteries. Mm. Um, the other test that we do uh, is called computerized uh, arterial pulse wave analysis, and that one measures both the large and the small arteries. So it's measuring uh, large arterial elasticity, but also small arterial elasticity, and indirectly in the really small arteries, uh, measuring endothelial dysfunction. So those two tests together will really tell you what's going on in your endothelium, small and large arteries. Now, are most clinics offering this, or is this you know somewhat unique to your guys' clinic? There, there are very few clinics that do the computerized arterial pulse wave analysis, and the endopad is catching on, but again, there's not that many centers that do both tests. So for people that uh, this may be new for them and they want to learn more, we'll put this on the show notes again, but you know, where do you rank these tests with, say, you know, traditional things like CT scan and so forth? Well, I like to look at the progression of arterial disease from a functional to a structural abnormality. 
And the functional tests are much more predictive early on of disease. Uh, so that's what you would get with the uh, computerized pulse wave analysis and the endopat. Uh, later on, you know, you have carotid duplex, which measures the thickness of the carotid enthema, but also plaque. That's more of a functional test. And then later on, you get into things like 2D echoes and coronary calcium score, which are looking at, you know, actual calcium blockage in the arteries, or you're looking at the left ventricular hypertrophy, the thickness of the left ventricle over oversized, or even heart failure, where the ability of the heart to pump each time it pumps out blood, it's called ejection fraction, can be low and an early sign of uh, stiffness of the heart muscle or failing of the heart muscle. Okay, so basically what I heard you say is you really like to look at the function first. And for a lot of people, that's that's the most practical way to go. But at, at really end-stage disease, that's when you would look at maybe like a CT scan and ejection fraction? Well, what, what we do in, in, in the institute is we, we actually look at all those things, and, and then we can stratify the people as to where they are on the spectrum of cardiovascular disease. So like, what I would like your audience to understand is the way uh, atherosclerosis, coronary heart disease, and vascular disease progress is it starts out usually in your teen years with functional changes, and then those progress later on to functional structural changes, and then later they go into really bad structural changes. So what you want to do is pick them up in the early spectrum where they're functional and not structural so you can reverse it easier. Mm -hmm. But we do all those tests fairly routinely in most patients, patients so we can say where you are in the spectrum of cardiovascular disease. Love that. And you see a lot of out-of-state patients. Is that right? Oh, yes. Out of, out of state. Yeah, they, they come in to see you. So awesome. So we'll put that in there. So let's transition a little bit and, and talk about blood sugar and how, how that's so very problematic in inducing this inflammatory response. And I think your ideal fasting sugar is in the low 80s. So you, you want to talk about that? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of studies that show that the increase in fasting blood sugar as well as two-hour postprandial blood sugar correlates directly with your risk for heart attack. And the set points in most labs are already too high and need to be lowered to really stratify risk. So the, the fasting blood sugar, the risk for, for heart disease and heart attack starts at 75 milligrams per deciliter. And most labs have their uh, their upper limit at 99. So if you go from 75 to 99, it's almost a 25% increase in heart disease risk just within what most labs would call the normal range. So it's about a one-to-one. -one. Every 1% 1 increase, one milligram percent increase in your fasting blood sugar is a 1% increase risk in heart attack risk. Mm -hmm. And what's even more worrisome is after you eat, uh, and your blood sugar goes up perhaps out of the normal level, like a glucose tolerance test, the number that most labs use there is 140 milligram per deciliter. Turns out the real number should be about 110. So if, if you say, well, I'm 140 and you're considered normal, you're really not because that's a 30 point difference between what it should be. And then your risk for heart attack is doubled for each increase in your blood sugar by one milligram percent. So that 30 point difference translates into a 60% increased risk in heart attack. Wow, that's incredible. And I've learned from you too this. You, you hit on something that reminded me of a seminar, again, we did in Colorado a long time ago, but the postprandial effect. So you talk that atherosclerosis doesn't happen while we're sitting there, you, you, you know, fasting. This happens after the meal. Is that right? Yeah, so post uh, atherosclerosis is really a postprandial event. It's a post-meal event because that's when your carbohydrates, your triglycerides, your inflammation, all the bad food products, the bacteria from leaky gut, whether live or dead bacteria, and all the products therein cause huge amounts of vascular inflammation unless you're a really amazing good eater and you don't have a leaky gut where all that stuff is literally just going straight in through the enterocyte lining and into your blood vessels. That was going to be my next question. There's so much research on endotoxin and so forth um, and, and that linked with the inflammatory response. So is that the connection, you know, if people are kind of like, well, wait, how does eating a bad diet cause heart disease? And one of your insults, Dr. Houston, is the, the inflammation. So is that the, the connection between poor gut health and heart disease? Yeah, there's a huge amount of data now on gut health, the microbiome, and how gastrointestinal problems are directly linked to cardiovascular problems. I mean, it's really no surprise, but I mean, 
I do cardiovascular medicine, but I have to be a good gastroenterologist. Otherwise, I can't clean up the mess that's coming in. And if you don't get the diet clean, get the gut repaired, reduce all the what is called metabolic endotoxemia after eating. Mm-hmm. It really is. It's low-grade sepsis uh, after you eat. Uh, and, and you get a huge inflammatory oxidative stress and immune dysfunction that occurs literally uh, not only in the enterocyte in the gut, but also transported then into the vascular system. Fascinating. So I've heard you talk about statins and the role that they're anti-inflammatory. Could that potentially be why statins may have a cardiovascular benefit due to this reduction in the inflammatory response? Yeah, it is exactly. Not in the gut, but in the arterial wall. Uh, The statins have pleiotropic effects that are uh, very anti-inflammatory. Uh, they increase nitric oxide, which is a very beneficial component of the vascular system. There's other natural things that do that too, like red yeast rice has great anti-inflammatory effects that, that can be similar to statins if you can't take a statin. So do you recommend then taking, is there some antioxidant protocol? I mean, you mentioned that there's a lot of this inflammation going on when we eat. And so are there some favorite nutrients that, that you personally take when you eat meals to help offset some of this inflammation? Yeah, there's some pretty good data that if you take either really healthy foods or antioxidants with food, that you can reduce this postprandial metabolic endotoxemia. That was first actually studied several years ago in the McDonald's study where they gave people Big Macs and French fries and and a Coke. They gave them vitamin C and vitamin E uh, at the same time. And those that took the antioxidants had less inflammatory changes in their blood vessels, less into toxemia, less into fetal dysfunction. So um, eating, uh, you know, really healthy foods like cruciferous vegetables, uh, olive oil, monounsaturated fats, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, and then a selected group of really good antioxidants like the appropriate type of ascorbic acid, appropriate type of uh, tocopherols, which is vitamin E, and maybe things like lipoic acid and coenzyme Q10. There's a whole host of things you could take that's a good broad spectrum can actually improve the postprandial uh, inflammation. Love it. People are going to be hitting the rewind button on this one to write down notes here, Dr. Houston. So let's kind of finish up on blood pressure. And this is, I've learned so much about, way more about blood pressure than I ever knew was available from you. So let's talk about kind of why elevated blood pressure is bad and then talk about the circadian rhythms linked to hypertension. Okay, so there's a direct correlation between your level of systolic and diastolic pressure. So systolic is the top number, diastolic is the bottom number. And the actual risk for a cardiovascular event, strokes, heart attack, heart failure, and kidney disease starts at a level of 110 over 70 millimeters of mercury. Now, the risk from 110 over 70 to 120 over 80 is, is fairly flat, but once you get 120 over 80, each increase in blood pressure by one millimeter, there's an incremental increase in risk for those uh, cardiovascular events. And this, the curve gets really steep at about 140 over 90. Uh, so, uh, but we, we call people pre-hypertension when they're between 120 over 80 and 140 over 90. And then 140 over 90 and above is, is clearly hypertension. And the higher the pressure, the greater the risk for an event. Now, what we've learned recently is the, tri- the driving force for all cardiovascular events, whether it's heart attack or stroke and, and other kidney diseases, is related to your nighttime blood pressure. So the nocturnal blood pressure, if it's elevated, that's the highest predictive risk for having an event. Now, the way that's put in the medical terms is called dipping status. So if if you have a daytime blood pressure that's a certain level and then at night it should drop by at least 10% of that average during the day, that's normal. But if you don't drop that 10%, your risk for having an event is greater because you don't dip appropriately. And then there are other people who not only don't dip appropriately, they actually reverse dip. In other words, they actually go higher at night. may really have an increased risk for uh, events. You see that in a lot of things. You see it in sleep apnea. You see it, see it in people who are salt sensitive or have really horrible diets. There's about probably 10 or 15 reasons that people don't dip appropriately. So you have to do a 24-hour blood pressure monitor to determine whether someone is a dipper or a non-dipper. And you can't do that with an office blood pressure. So again, we determine a lot of our diagnosis and treatment on office readings and, and or people checking their blood pressure at home with their own cuff. But honestly, uh, if you don't do a 24-hour blood pressure monitor, you can't even get to the nocturnal pressure stuff 
So you can't really tell what is the risk, number one. But number two, you can't even tell them what drugs they need to take or what time they need to take their drugs. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there's a study that just came out that said if you have a certain blood pressure and you take two groups and the same blood pressure elevations, you put one group on the good antihypertensive drugs in the morning and you put the other group on the same drugs at night, the ones who take them at night, because it changes the dipping status and makes their protection better of their arteries, have, have somewhere around 35 to 40 percent decrease in stroke and heart attack, even though they're on the same medicine at the same dose. Gosh, that's amazing. Yeah, the circadian clock system and, and biological rhythms, that, that's really fascinating stuff. So if I'm a patient and you're telling me this, like, am I going to have to get up every hour to, to get my blood pressure? Like, what are some of the practical ways that we can assess our nocturnal blood pressure? Yeah, the, the only way, the only way to assess nocturnal blood pressure is a 24-hour blood pressure monitor. So it's a, it's a computer that we put it on, it attaches to your belt. You have the cuff that goes on your arm, automatically set to go off at steady intervals. It measures your pressure, puts it in the computer, download the computer the next day, and I can read out every blood pressure and heart rate you've had. It tells me exactly what time you had those pressures. I can tell you your blood pressure load, your average, your nocturnal dipping status, all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. And then I can really tell you what you need to do. I love that. So it's something that, you know, if I was a patient of yours, you would give to me, I'd take it home, then you would get the data on your computer. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Really good stuff. So let's kind of talk about, you know, a lot of people, and I saw this when I was doing nutritional work in a, you know, internal medicine practice, uh, a lot of the patients were on beta blockers and thiazide diuretics, which if people don't understand, I'll, I'll let you explain what those drugs are. But those drugs actually induce, you know, we talked about how bad blood sugar is just before we got into blood pressure. Those drugs affect blood sugar. So Let's talk about you know what are the new medications of someone you know supplements aren't working and so forth lifestyle is not working they need a push like talk to us about some of the the quote unquote Marcusen approved medications. Yeah, the best medications I think are ACE inhibitors, uh, angiotensin receptor blockers, and cal- and certain calcium channel blockers. Uh, I don't really use a lot of the older beta blockers that cause all kinds of metabolic disturbances drugs like atenolol and atopolol for blood pressure. Now, if, for another reason, that's another story. And I don't use hydrochlorothiazide uh, hardly ever. I uh, rarely use chlorothalidone. My favorite diuretic, if I use one, is endapamide. My favorite calcium channel blocker is amlodipine, which is Norvasc. And then I use the longer-acting ACE inhibitors uh, like perindopril, ramipril, quinopril, and I use the longer-acting uh, angiotensin receptor block- blockers like Benacar uh, and, and Micardis and Edarby. Uh, so those agents using combinations, uh, the appropriate combinations, are my top drugs. Mm-hmm. Now, if I'm going to use a, a beta blocker, the only two that I think are really good for hypertension that work well and don't cause metabolic problems are nebevolol and carvedilol because they have a different effect than the other beta blockers. Really great information. So for someone listening now that may have a, a husband or spouse or you know, in-law or something that, that's on maybe an ACE inhibitor or an ARB or a calcium channel blocker, is it best just to start taking those at night if they haven't yet had this 24-hour blood pressure assessment? Well, that's the other tricky thing is if you're one of these people that's a, an excessive dipper, in other words, you, you, you drop more than 10%, uh, that's another issue because excessive dippers also have a greater risk for stroke and heart attack. So uh, you have to really look at their 24-hour blood pressure monitor to figure out where their dipping is. And if they're dip, they're not dipping, yes, you give it at night, which is what most people don't do. They're, the excessive dippers are really pretty rare. Uh, but if you put an excessive dipper on a nighttime medication, it could actually make them worse. So you have to really, in my opinion, get the data and then decide what to do. Great information. So let's talk then about some of the lifestyle tips. I know you're huge into exercise. You know, I've seen you work out at like six in the morning when we've been at seminars together. So let's talk about some of the top lifestyle tips that you find to be most effective for improving overall cardiovascular health. All right, so if you you took a group of people and you wanted to say, what can I do without taking medications? Number one is going to be restrict your sodium to 2 grams per day and increase your potassium to about 10 grams per day. Second is do a daily exercise program for one hour, which is a mixed program of uh, resistance training for about 40 minutes and then interval aerobics done correctly for about 20 minutes. You never want to go over an hour because you get an overexercise syndrome. Uh, 
And you want to do that preferably daily, but if you can't, try to do at least four days per week. Mm -hmm. Then you want to get to uh, the Mediterranean diet where you've got really good complex foods, low refined carbohydrates, a lot of omega-3s, a lot of olive oil, monounsaturated fats, a lot of vegetables, some fruit, mostly berries, um, get get in a lot of uh, cold water fish. Uh, minimize the red meat. Uh, be sure you use an organic uh, chicken and fish if you can. And then the last part, uh, obviously, which is get your ideal body weight, but body weight's uh, not really the issue. It's your body composition. What's your body fat, particularly the fat around your belly called visceral fat. And then obviously don't use any tobacco products whatsoever. Perfect. Now, if there's just one supplement that you're used in, or we can just say an herb or botanical, like you're going on a long trip and you only have room for one thing, what would that herb or botanical be and why? Omega-3 fatty acids, without a doubt. They have the best data in the literature for reducing heart attack, uh, stroke, uh, improving endothelial function, uh, as well as huge other numbers of things like changing your lipid profile for the best, improving your glucose profile. And so that if I had to pick one thing, that would be it. Perfect. Now, along those lines, are you using omega-3 index in the, the red blood cell to kind of look and see where people are at? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. On every patient that comes in, we do omega-3 index, and, and then we titrate the dose that they take based on that number. Now, I've learned from you, and I think you know there's a researcher, I think at Wake Forest, who did a lot of research on GLA. You also throw that into the mix. You want to talk about why that's so beneficial? Yeah. When I developed uh, the product that I use uh, for robotics research, it's called EFA Search Supreme. We did a lot of research in the literature, but also I consulted with some of the top researchers in the country who did omega-3 uh, research. And so this data that we looked at showed that if you take omega-3 fatty acids, which is DHA and EPA long-term, you start to deplete GLA, which is another form of uh, one of the, it's an excellent omega-6, but it's a good omega-6. Mm-hmm. And then the other part is if you take a lot of GLA long-term, you deplete uh, the omega-3s, DHA and EPA. So the balance of those has to be appropriate, and the balance has to be whatever your total uh, omega-3s are as DHA and EPA, you want at least 50% of that as GLA to keep the ratios in the right proportions Mm -hmm. long term. And then the other thing that's very important for people to understand, omega-3s are very oxidizable in your cell membranes as well as in the bottle. And if you you do too many omega-3s without protection of the membrane from oxidizing, that could be detrimental. So the balance is you have to give tocopherol, which is a form of vitamin E. It's called gamma delta tocopherol to balance out that oxidative stress. So in the cardio, excuse me, in the EFA Cert Supreme from Biotics, all that's in there in the right proportion, so you don't have to worry about it. You just take ever how many capsules a day you need to get the benefit that you want. Yeah, that's a really good product. I'm glad you mentioned that. Two last questions here, Dr. Houston. If you were in an this is a question we ask every guest on the show. If you were in an elevator with Barack Obama or a congressman and you had to share with them just, you know, 30, 60 seconds, you know, one lifestyle health tip that you wish they would kind of implement, whether it be a policy change or an you know, educational program, what would that health or lifestyle tip be and why? I would I would say to them do you realize that if you had proper diet, nutrition, exercise, and weight management, you could reduce 80% of cardiovascular disease in the United States and also probably have a similar impact on cancer? Mm-hmm. So why don't you start paying <laughs> for, for nutrition consultation, exercise, weight management programs, and, and, and get away from the, just paying for drugs, which it sort of is the end result of trying to prevent problems. Mm -hmm. Great information there, Dr. Houston. So really appreciate you coming on the show and all your wisdom and knowledge. Now, what are some of the best online resources and what do you have cooking? I know you're doing a lot of seminars and stuff like that. Like where can, I guess, patients find you and then where can practitioners learn more about some of your trainings? Uh, Well, first of all, give them my website, which is hypertensioninstitute.com. And I have huge amounts of free information on there. Uh, related to uh, testing that we do, tests that we do for both uh, non-invasive testing as well as biomarkers in the blood. Uh, We also have uh, free downloads uh, for articles and and other things. And then for education, you know, you've got the books that I've written that can go on Amazon.com and do the 
what your doctor may not tell you about hypertension, uh, what your doctor may not tell you about heart disease. Those are both lay books, very readable, but also good for practitioners. Mm -hmm. Symposium, we do all over the country. We do the Institute of Functional Medicine, uh, the Metabolic Medicine Institute, uh, A4M, and and I'm speaking at other conferences as well, but those are the ones that have really intensive courses for cardiovascular disease. Great, Dr. Houston. Well, hope you have a great afternoon and really appreciate you sharing your wisdom with us in the show. Oh, it's and my I'll make pleasure. Sure. Thanks for having me on, Mike. Thanks, awesome. really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.